Okay, so we are continuing a, a series called From the Heights. You know, there's a song we sing with that title. You all know that? We've, we've even sung it in this class. So we don't just sing oldies uh, in, in, in this class. Sometimes we sing new songs. And there were three psalms that are, that are referenced or quoted in that song from the heights that we sing here. Who, who remembers what those psalms are? Psalm 23 is one of them. That's, that's correct. One thirty nine. That's another one. It starts with 139, and then it goes to 23, and then it ends with 42 and 43. Yes. Okay. So we'll be doing a review uh, of those psalms next week. <laughs> no. And so then, since then, we have continued, since we're reading through the psalms over the summer here as the church is our scripture of the day, uh, we have continued by picking kind of a psalm of the week from the psalms that we'll be reading in the coming week. So this week we're reading 121 to 130, and so we're going to look today at 126. So this is kind of a look ahead for you at one of the psalms that you'll be reading this week if you're reading along with us in the scripture of the day. And this uh, particular psalm is one that you might not be as familiar with as some of the other psalms. Uh, and that's one reason why I chose it, so that we can become more familiar with it. So let me begin by reading uh, Psalm 126. You can see it's, it's a song of ascents. And it says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So now you know why we sang that first song. Because it comes from this particular psalm. So you'll notice that it's a, a song of ascents, and uh, this is a group of psalms, Psalm 120 to 134, those 15 psalms are, have this title, the Song of Ascents, and it's because these are songs that the people of Israel would sing as they were ascending, as they were going up to Jerusalem uh, every year for the annual feasts. Uh, for Pe Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, three times a year. And, and you can uh, imagine, some of you have been to Israel, you can imagine you live up around the Sea of Galilee somewhere, and uh, everybody kind of gathers together, and you walk down along the Jordan River, through the Jordan River Valley, that would be the easiest way to do it. And then you get to Jericho, and you make a right turn, and go up the mountain, I mean, it sounds so simple when you read it in the Bible. Yeah, they went up from Jericho to Jerusalem, but you're walking up a, a couple of thousand feet of, of elevation change, uh, and it's, it is like walking up a mountain. And so if I'm walking up a mountain, let's sing some songs uh, to keep the kids quiet in the, in the back of the minivan here. Uh, and so uh, that's, what, that's what they would do. And it's interesting, it, you know, this would be a whole different study. You could look at these psalms and think about these are the ones that were chosen to be sung as they walked up to Jerusalem. And, and you might think that, that some of these would be interesting. The, one of the things that stands out to me is right in the middle, 127 and 128, are two psalms that talk about family. And I think that that's significant, that right at the center of these uh, list of songs, there are two that highlight the family. But this one that we're looking at here, it says in verse 1, it's when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. And so we, we believe that that's a reference to their return from the Babylonian captivity. That's another reason why I chose this psalm, because we're, we're studying Zechariah in the main services, right? And talking, and he's a prophet after they came back from Babylon. So 
This is in that same time period of, of the return of people, the people from Babylon back to Jerusalem. And the, there were basically three returns that were told of in the Bible. First one was in 538 BC, and, and the leader was a guy named Zerubbabel, which is just a fun name to say. You should say it whenever you can. Name your cat Zerubbabel. I don't know. You can read about this in Ezra 1 to 6. And then there was a second one that was 80 years later, 458 BC, under Ezra. You read about that in Ezra 7 to 10. And then another one a few years later, 445, under Nehemiah. And you can read about that in Nehemiah 1 and 2. And uh, the, the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, they show up uh, in between the first and second return. They show up in 520 B.C. You read about them showing up in Ezra chapter 5, and then you can read their, their prophecies. So that's kind of the introduction to the, to the psalm. And uh, you can see that when they returned, they were pretty happy. They were pretty happy to be back. And, and so let's look at verses 1 to 3, and this is number 1 on your outline. They praise God for what he has done, and that's what you're going to see them doing here. It says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. So they are praising the Lord for what he has done. We should praise the Lord for what he's done. They say that it, when they came back, it was like a dream. It was like a dream that they got to come back, even though this return fulfilled prophecy. Jeremiah had said it would be 70 years, and after 70 years, they, they did come back. But the actual event was apparently quite overwhelming for them. And when it says it's like a dream, that's like it was hard to believe that it actually happened. It's almost like it's too good to be true. And you can see they, they were... Uh, they were very happy. It says in verse 2 that their mouths were filled with laughter, their tongues with shouts of joy. I mean, they were delirious with joy over this turn of events. And I would, I would venture to say um, not many of us have ever experienced anything like what they're talking about here, this kind of a homecoming. You may have had a homecoming from somewhere uh, but uh, very unlikely that he, any of us have spent 70 years in captivity. Some of us may have come home from difficult situations. We may have come home from uh, being in the military and engaged in, in some activity somewhere in the world, and then you come home, you, you can see that's a big deal, right? I mean, that when they do those surprise visits where dad comes home, from being deployed overseas and he shows up at his daughter's softball game or whatever and everybody goes crazy because they weren't expecting him. They did it as a surprise. You, you could even say they're delirious with joy. Uh, or the woman comes home from being deployed somewhere for a long time and, and she's met at the airport by her dog who's excited to see. Even the dog is delirious with, with joy. I mean, it's a big, it's a big deal. Uh, this, was, this is a big deal for, for them to, to come home like this. I remember the first time I, I made an overseas trip, I, I was gone for at least a week. And it was in South Africa, and I came home, and Roberta met me at the airport, and I said, I'm glad to see you. I, I'm glad to be home, and I'm glad I'm an American. I mean, people who want to put down America, and there's plenty to put down, but just go somewhere else for a while. Yeah. You, might not, you might feel like it, it's pretty good here after, after a while. But anyways, they, they were delirious with joy. And here, here's the amazing thing, is it says at the end of verse 2, then they said among the nations, the Lord, Yahweh, they use his name, Yahweh, has done great things for them. That's an extraordinary expression there because many of those nations hated Israel. 
that even they had to acknowledge, yeah, the Lord has done great things for them. I mean, we've never seen anything like this before. And so uh, that's an extraordinary response. We can understand the people being happy and joyful, but for the nations to acknowledge that the Lord had done this, that's an extraordinary event. And the highlight of their return uh, is recorded for us in, in uh, Ezra uh, chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3. Well, let, let's start in Ezra chapter 1 and actually read about the return. And then we'll go to chapter 3 to see what it was all about. It says in Ezra chapter 1, Ezra's four books back from Psalms. Those of you that are using digital devices, you cheaters. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's all right. Ezra chapter 1 says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Uh, this is an amazing thing here. Cyrus is not a believer. He, he's a pagan king of a pagan nation, Persia, which is beat up on Babylon, and they inherited these Israelite captives. And the Lord stirred up his heart. Uh, the, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. And it's like streams of water. He can direct it any way he wants. I think that's, that still stands true today. Anyways, verse 2. That thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. This is an amazing statement. Uh, you, know, you guys need to go back to Jerusalem where your God is and rebuild your temple. And hey, just take whatever you need from your neighbors. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Verse 5, then rose up the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit of everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And then it talks about how they were all aided by, their, by the people there, uh, and they went back to Jerusalem. Ver verse 1 of chapter 2 says, Now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. So there's the decree to uh, return, and they go back. And, and as Cyrus says, you need to go back and build the temple of your God. And so in chapter 3, that, that's what we see happening. Look at chapter 3, verse 8. It says, now in the second year after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem. So if, they, if 538 was the first uh, time, that was when they returned. So two years later is 536. Keep, keep that date in mind, 536. They come to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month of Zerubbabel, the, king of she, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites and all who came to Jerusalem from the captivity, they appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Joshua, and with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. 
and all the people shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though, the, though many shouted for joy. So the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping, for the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. This was a big deal. This was a really big deal. So uh, this is what happened. They came back, and within two years, they have laid the foundation uh, for their temple. Uh, and as it says in Psalm 128, verse 3, they were glad. Yeah, they, they were glad. So this is like a spiritual high for the people. I mean, yeah, we know God promised that he was going to send us back after 70 years, but wow, it actually happened. And the king was the one who made the decree, and all our neighbors gave us all this stuff to help us, and now we're back here, we're getting settled in, and we've laid the foundation for the temple. This is incredible. But as we're going to read, this high didn't last for long. And we're going to see about that in a minute. And that's kind of like what you and I experience at times in our life. We have spiritual highs, and then they're followed by times that aren't so high. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So let's, let's just think about that for a minute. Let's just talk through some examples of times when we experience great joy, like they're experiencing, that lasts for a while, but it doesn't last forever forever, okay? Uh, and you might be thinking of some of the things that would fall into that category. I think one of them is the incredible joy you experience at the moment of salvation. And, and you have a, a lot of strong feelings. Those, those feelings don't, don't, aren't the same forever, though, are they? No, let, we can be honest at church on a Sunday morning that that joy that we have of salvation, we don't, we're not experiencing that level of joy all the time. And, and basically what we're talking about here is kind of that outward joy that you're feeling. You can still have a, jo a joy in your heart over your salvation, and you do, but the, but the overall feelings are not the same. Am I, am I right about that? Because we, it's through many tribulations that we enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there's a lot of hard things that we have to deal with along the way. I think uh, another that kind of goes along with that is the joy of spiritual victories that we experience in, in our lives. You know, our, our lives were characterized by, by sinful things, and then we get saved and we experience Victories. I don't know about you, but for me, and I think for a lot of people, you experience a lot of kind of initial victories, like there's some things that just seem to like go away right away, but there's other things that you're fighting for the rest of your life. Uh, our fight with sin d d never comes to an end in this life. And while there are some sins that seem to go away right, right away, there are others that uh, uh, we're going to be battling with till the day we die. So you, you got to get that initial joy. You know, you're seeing things happen. That's evidence that God's at work in your life, and you're excited about it. But there's still a lot of battles to go. Uh, you know, in Titus chapter three, verse three, it says, "We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray." slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Yeah, and there's a change that takes place, and there's some of these things that, that seem like they go away immediately, but then there's other ones that we're still battling. Right? Are we, or am I the only one? Okay, all right, good, all right. Uh, there's also the joy that we experience over spiritual fellowship. You, you know, there are times, there are seasons 
where you're, maybe it's within your fellowship group or, or some uh, friends that you have, you're experiencing a really great season of, of the joy of fellowship. Um, and maybe you've experienced that at different times in your life, but that doesn't always last. Some of those people move away. Some of those people die. Some of those people fall away from the Lord. And so there's, there's heartbreak that goes along too with the joys of, of fellowship. Uh, how about the joy of a new work for God, like planting a church? I don't know, something like that. Anybody here when this church was started? All right, some of you were here when this church got started. Exciting times, things are happening. And things, still there are exciting things happening, but not every, every day is as exciting as the, as the last, right? I mean, there are things we get excited about, and now it's like, let's get back to reality here and the day-to-day -day life uh, that we have to live. There's a lot of challenges involved in, uh, in starting a, a new church. And uh, uh, this church was fortunate in that there was a core team of 12 couples, most of whom had been working together for years in ministry in Aliso Viejo, and so they all came up here working together and they were given the money, the resources that they needed to get things started here at the church. And for the, the first year, all I ever heard from Bobby was how hard this was. <laughs> he, he, you don't go into the pastoral ministry thinking, yeah, I got to go down to City Hall today and get a use permit for the school we're going to meet in. You're not, you're not thinking you have to do stuff like that. Uh, so there's the joy of the new work, and, and it is a great joy, but there's a lot of work. It, there is, there's a reason why there's work in that uh, sentence. Some of us have experienced the joy of a retreat experience. You know, we go up on the mountain, we have this retreat, we're all together for a weekend, we have a great time, great teaching, great fellowship, great worship, uh, and, and all of that. And uh, we, we're just, it's, it's a mountaintop high. And then we come home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a smart retreat speaker, the final message is preparing you to go home now. Because the, the great joy that you experience there, and that might have been kind of like what the people experienced as they're, making the ascent up to Jerusalem. They go to Jerusalem. They're there for a week. It's an incredible time. You know, in Jesus' day, there might have been two million people in and around Jerusalem, and, and they're having a great time. It's like worship you've never heard before, and then they go back to their synagogue of 25 people, and the worship isn't so exciting. Um, but uh, it, it's that kind of a thing. Israel had great joy it was like a dream the thing about dreams is they don't last you you wake up eventually it's like a dream and so they had this time of incredible and intense joy but there were tough times ahead so look at verse 4 there in psalm 126 and this is our second point. They're, they're saying, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Now, you might be wondering, what are you talking about? You, we already saw in verse 1 that he did restore you. So what, what is it you're asking for? Well, they're asking God to fulfill his promises because this wasn't the end. This wasn't all that God had promised their return. There was more to it than that. And hard times quickly followed those initial days of excitement. So if you go back to Ezra, again, well, let's pick it up in chapter 4. So they, they've laid the foundation. They're all excited. This thing is up and running here. Here we go. And then chapter 4 starts off with verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, 
let us build with you. For we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so uh, the building project comes to a halt. Right there, they, they were discouraged. They've got adversaries and they stopped and it doesn't say that when they stopped, they shouted with great joy. And they're not shouting with great joy anymore. That, that, that part has ended. Now remember, they started this project in the second year uh, of their return. So that was what year? 536. Chapter 5 of, Ez, of Ezra is when Haggai and Zechariah show up. Who remembers when they showed up? What year? 520. So let's see, from 536 to 520, how many years is that? 16 years. And the purpose for Haggai and Zechariah was to stir them up to continue the building project. So how long did this building project get stopped for? 16 years. You think the building project here is taking a long time. <laughs> we got nothing to complain about. 16 years the project gets stopped. Um, they had received some blessings from the Lord, but they, they know that there's much more to, to come. This isn't the end of what the Lord has for them. In fact, they know that a part of that much more that's yet to come is the coming of the Messiah. Yeah, they may have returned to the land. Yeah, they may have started rebuilding the temple, but we're still waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah didn't meet us here in Jerusalem. We're still waiting for the Messiah. So they asked the Lord to restore our fortunes like streams in the Negev. The Negev is the southern desert of Israel. And it is bone dry most of the year. And, and there are riverbeds, or over there they call them wadis. Uh, and so when it rains, the water comes rushing down from the mountains because everything's bone dry. It comes rushing down from the mountains, and these wadis, these riverbeds, are now overflowing just like that. It, it, it's an amazing thing. I think we went through a wadi on a on, a, on our way to Masada that one time in our bus, and I was a little concerned that our bus driver was going to get us there safely because the, you see the water coming, and uh, it's, a pretty formidable, it's a pretty formidable thing. And so they're asking him to uh, bring the overflow of his blessings up, upon them. And, and so that's like us. We experience initial blessings in, in receiving our salvation, but we know that there's a lot more to come, right? This is not our best life now. Uh, our best life is yet to come. And we are waiting for that time. We're looking for the Lord to come and establish his kingdom here on earth. That's why he told us to pray, your kingdom come. We're looking forward to something greater than what we've experienced so far. We're looking forward to the fullness of what's been promised to us. And that's what this prayer is in, in verse four. It's asking God to, to fulfill all, all of his promises. And Zechariah in particular uh, mentions the coming of the Lord a number of times. Let's turn to Zechariah and, and look at some of his prophecies. We saw one uh, last week when we looked at Zechariah chapter two in verse 10, Zechariah 2.10, he, 
He says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. So there's a, a promise of his coming. It, it's, he says, I come like it's an imminent thing, and I will dwell in your midst. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. So, you know, they're there in Jerusalem. Yeah, they've laid the foundation for the next temple and, and all that, but they know that there's a whole lot more yet to come. Uh, they're building the temple, but the Lord hasn't returned yet. Look at uh, chapter 8, Zechariah chapter 8. It says, And the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with a great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with his staff in hand because of great age, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord. You, you guys are thinking there's no way that where we're going to see this happen. And the Lord's saying, you might think that. But that's not what I'm thinking. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. That's what's coming. And that's what they're asking him to do. And, and the Jews today, uh, even though they, they, they overlook Christ as their Messiah to this day for the most part, they still believe that this is going to happen. And those of you that just went to Israel, you know that they are ready to build another temple. Just, just give them the signal and, and they are ready to go and build another temple because they believe the Lord is coming. They believe what this says. Chapter 9, verse 9, is a familiar verse. We looked at this, uh, I think, on uh, Palm Sunday. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? There's a prophecy of Christ entering into Jerusalem. And then in chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, says, On that day, living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, that would be the Dead Sea, and half of them to the western sea, that would be the Mediterranean. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth on that day. The Lord will be the one and his name one. That's what they're looking forward to. This is what Zechariah is, is saying to the people there. And, and so that's what they're asking him to do. And this idea of uh, restoring our fortunes like the streams in the Negev, where you know, when it rains, all of a sudden, boom, those, those rivers are overflowing. Well, if you look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9, which uh, if you heard the sermon last night, you've already seen this verse, but if you're going to hear it next hour, this is a little sneak ahead here. It says in Zechariah 3, verse 9, it says, For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. Boom. It's going to happen just like that. The Lord's going to come. There's going to be a remnant of Israel that's going to believe. They're going to be ready for their Messiah. And it's going to happen. So that's what they're asking for. This is great what's happened so far, but we're still looking for the, pro the fulfillment of all the promises. And, and we need to learn from that. We need to rejoice in what the Lord has done, uh, but we can't, you know, kind of wallow in it and, and long for the good old days. You know, I remember that retreat. 
in 1992. Man, it was so awesome. The fellowship, the worship, the teaching, life-changing experience. Okay, that was 1992. <laughs> we're not longing for the good old days. We're looking for better days. And the past blessing just provides a ground for a strong hope in future blessings that are promised by God, and those promises are backed up by His character. Are God's promises any good? Yeah. yeah. Is His character trustworthy? Does his steadfast love endure forever? Yeah. So he's made promises, and we're looking forward uh, to the fulfillment of all those promises. The fact that he's blessed us in the past is what encourages us to believe he's going to do it in the future. He's going to do all that he said he's going to do. Is that, is that encouraging? Yeah. This, this life is not the, the end of it. We haven't, it's not heaven until you get to heaven. Okay, and, and we're not in the kingdom now. If this is the kingdom now, this is pretty disappointing. The kingdom is yet to come when Christ returns and establishes that kingdom. So what do we do between now and then? Well, let's go back to Psalm 126 and look at verses 5 and 6 which is those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So this is number three on your outline. We need to serve God faithfully with hope in the meantime. The joy of reaping comes after the hard work of the sowing. And oftentimes that sowing involves weeping, which just highlights the fact that it is hard work that we're doing in serving the Lord now. Serving the Lord is hard work for, for Christian people. Serving the Lord is hard work. What are some of the factors that make it hard? Opposition. Yeah, not everybody is excited that we want to serve the Lord. Yeah. Okay, what else? You weren't talking about these people. All right, yeah. Working with people is hard work. You, you know, uh, somebody was asking recently uh, about, you know, well, how does this work here where, like, everybody is on the pastoral staff is almost like related to each other. Uh, like there's a dad and two of his sons. And kind of the assumption was that th th these guys, you know, have this little, they have this inside deal and they work everything for their advantage. You know, that's, that's kind of the assumption of the question. And so the person who was asked the question was very wise and said, well, let me, let me ask you, if you worked with your dad, would you and your dad agree on everything? And he said, oh, no. And he goes, that tells you what it's like. It's what it's like around here. Just because we're related doesn't mean we agree on everything. Sorry, do you agree with everything, with everybody you're related with? No. Thanks for the honesty. <laughs> Thanks for the honesty. Yeah, sometimes our strongest disagreements are with people we're related to. And when we really want to freak people out, we say, well, Pastor Taylor, his sister is married to our other son. And then they go, how can these things be? But that's, that's the way it is. So, yeah, dealing with people. What else? Yes, John. Oh, I could tell you stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we, we have this thing called the flesh. And, and my flesh can be pretty lazy. You know, you're talking about work. Uh, my, my flesh doesn't always want to work. It can be pretty lazy. Or I, or I have to deal with my own pride. Or, 
my, my own weaknesses. Also, the world is opposed to us, like we talked about, and the world is out to distract us away from the work that we're called to do. Uh, yeah. Burnout is another thing. That's, that comes as a result, too, of me having a wrong emphasis on what I'm doing. Because if I'm doing what the Lord wants in the way the Lord wants me to do, He's going to strengthen and sustain me, right? But if I get off onto my own thing, I can burn myself out. Um, also, we have an enemy. Uh, he's, he's not rejoicing that, oh, hey, look at all those people at Bible class this morning. Isn't that wonderful? He, he's not thinking this is a good thing. He, he is opposed. We have an enemy. You know, and if you ever hear people like they'll say, you know, the Mormons, it seems like they get along so well with each other. And why can't the church be more like the Mormons? Well, the Mormons are working for the enemy. The enemy's working against us. So that creates problems. So it, it is hard work. But at the end of the, of the weeping and the sowing, there is a joyful harvest. That, that's the hope that we have that if we are faithful in serving the Lord, uh, there will be joy in the, in the end. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Those are good words. You, you, it, is, it is hard, it is difficult, we do grow weary, but we will reap if we don't give up. And you think about this as you think about the people coming back to, to Israel. Uh, think about what the land was like when they returned. Uh, it had been devastated by the Babylonians, and then it had been sitting there just growing weeds for 70 years. And... Uh, there's a lot of hard work that they had to do to get it back to where it would produce for them. And if you've been to Israel, you'll see that even today there's the terracing and they have the vineyards on these, on these terraces that they have built on the sides of the mountains. That's not easy to do. And you have to remove all the rocks. And there are rocks everywhere in Israel. That's why you know stoning was such a common thing because it was easy. There were stones everywhere. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it was an easy thing to do. And so uh, there's stones everywhere. There's a, uh, there's a joke that said that the angel who was distributing the rocks around the world at the creation, uh, the bag broke over Israel. <laughs> That's not true. That's not in the Bible. It's just illustrating a point that there are an awful lot of rocks uh, in, in Israel. So you had to level the ground, you had to clear the ground, you had to plow the ground, you had to sow the seeds. It's a lot of work. City folk like us, we don't, we don't get that, but that's a, that's a lot of work. And that's what it is like for us in, in ministry. And I just want to show you some New Testament pictures. Uh, look with me at the book of James. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Which says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So again, it's the, it's the laboring with hope. It's being patient with hope. Coming of the Lord is at hand. And so we're going to faithfully labor with the expectation that the Lord is coming. Uh, I like that picture there. If you look over at 1 Timothy chapter 4, Which, uh, you know, earlier in that passage, he's talking about disciplining or training yourself for godliness. 
And he says, for to this end we toil and strive. Now those are two Greek words, uh, very picturesque Greek words. The word for toil is kapos, which means to work to the point of exhaustion. And the word for uh, strive is the Greek word agonizomai, which means just like what it sounds like. You've got to agonize over this thing. Why, 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 do we, why do we do this? Because, it says there in verse 10, we have our hope set on the living God. We, we, we will put in the, the toil and the labor and the striving because we have a sure hope. And it's found in the living God. And he's going to keep all of his promises. That's what keeps me going today. Be faithful today because I have a hope, a real hope, not a hope so. I have a certainty that's found in God. One other uh, verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. This is after uh, a whole chapter about the resurrection. Someday we're going to be resurrected. Did you know that? And you're going to get like a new body. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that day. I think that's why we get old, so that we'll long all the more for that new body. Junior hires, they're not thinking a lot about that. But, uh, but I am, I'll tell you that. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, here's the conclusion to the whole thing about this, the resurrection. Christ is resurrected. That guarantees our resurrection. This is what's going to happen. We're going to get new bodies, resurrected bodies. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You're not wasting your time laboring in the Lord because we know what, what the end is going to be. I don't know that you could say that about anything else. You, you could labor at a lot of other things and you can't say it's, not, it's not, never going to be in vain to do that. You know, I, I worked for a bank, a major bank here in the state of California, and uh, they would, the, the uh, marketing department there, they lived in a different world than the real world. And they would come up with these slogans that just uh, didn't help us. Like one was, we're the bank you don't have to think about. You know, just bring your money to us, we'll take care of it, you don't have to think about us. Do you know how many customers told me that they were thinking about us? <laughs> that, that, didn't, that, didn't, that just gave fuel to their fire. And then another one that they had is, we're your bank for life. You can come and we can take care of you for the rest of your life. Uh, they made a golf towel that said, we're your bank for life. I still have that towel on my golf bag, but that bank doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I'm not the bank for my life. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you, you can labor at a lot of things in vain. It's not going to be there in the end. But that's never true if you're laboring for the Lord because you're investing in people who have an eternal life ahead of them. It's never a waste of time. And that's the point. If I believe that the Lord is coming, if I believe I'm going to be resurrected, if I believe I'm going to get a new body, if I believe all of that, then that's, the, that's what energizes me today to serve the Lord and do all the hard work that I have to do. Yeah, there is hard work, and yes, there is heartbreak. Uh, people will let you down. People do walk away. Uh, that there is heartbreak, but there's there's never a reason to quit. Never a reason to quit. You know, the Galatians, going back to Galatians for just a minute, they gave the Apostle Paul uh, fits. Uh, the Galatian situation was not good. And Paul is writing to the churches there, and he says to them in chapter 4, verse 11, 
This is the same guy that said, your labor in the Lord is never in vain. He does say this in Galatians 4.11. He says, I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain because you're walking away. You're departing from what we gave you. So did he say, so I'm done with you people. Is that, is that how he concluded it? Like, I'm, I'm over you people. You know, he says in verse 19, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. The story wasn't over. So there's still hope for these people. And so he says, I'm going to keep laboring away. I'm going to keep laboring away. So yeah, there's heartbreak. You can feel the heartbreak, but there's no quit. No quit. And you got to keep the goal in mind. And, and I'll, I'll finish with this, Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Here Paul gives like the purpose statement for ministry. This is what we're aiming for. What, are, what is it we're trying to accomplish here? What's, what's the, the big picture it says, Him we proclaim, Christ we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, why? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. That, that's the goal. The goal is to have mature followers of Jesus Christ. And he says, so he says in verse 29, for this we toil, struggling, with all his energy that he powerfully works within us. All the energy I got, I'm investing in this goal of bringing people to Christ and seeing them become mature followers of Christ. That's the labor. That's the work uh, that we have to do. Uh, th that's the, the sowing that we're doing. And uh, we need to be faithful now, believing that in the end, there will be a harvest. Does that make any sense? So, you know, you go back and think about Psalm 126. You think about the people at that time. You think about their situation. Uh, they praised God for what he had done. We need to do that. Praise God for what he's done. But we need to keep in mind that there's a lot more to come. This isn't over. There's a lot more to come that we have to look forward to. So we need to faithfully serve him now, no matter how hard or challenging it might be. And, you know, and the people of Israel, they, 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 that returned, well, they started well, but they got discouraged and they quit for 16 years. Six, that's a lot of discouragement right there. 16 years. It's so discouraged, God has to send them not one, but two prophets to stir them up to get back on the, on the project here. Two prophets. So the good news there is God didn't quit. God doesn't quit. We just need to be faithful to serve him, believing in him, trusting him, that everything he's promised, he will do. So how's that? How's that for you, people come, returning from exile? You ready to go out and plow some fields and plant some crops? Maybe not. But you might be ready to go serve the Lord in some way and reach out to somebody in the name of the Lord. Okay, any, uh, any questions? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, well, so what's the main reason people give up, you mean, within the church? Yeah. Well, a, a lot of times, uh, it, I'm, a, I'm assuming you're, they, they don't walk away, they just kind of give up. They're still around, but they're not actively involved anymore. I, I think it's because they, they're not keeping their, their eyes on the end of it. And, and maybe they had unrealistic expectations of what the ministry was going to be like. This toiling and, and agonizing, I, I, I'm not sure I signed up for that. So I'm happy to let somebody else do that. 
but I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that anymore. And, and so it, it's a lack, it's, it's always a lack of a, of a confident hope in, in God that would lead people to give up now. And that's why when these prophets start talking to them, yeah, they, they exhort them. I mean, Haggai is kind of in their face. He's, uh, hey, you guys are building nice houses for yourself. How about the Lord's house? Well, see, nobody was opposing them building nice houses for themselves. But, you know, what about the Lord? So he's kind of in their face, whereas Zechariah is talking about the future. What you're doing is a part of what God's doing now that's going to have a glorious future. That's, I think that's the thing, is that they don't have a sure hope. Or, or, and maybe they think that they should be rewarded right here, right now, and it's not happening right here, right now. You know, when I, when I was a young man, I thought, well, this pastoring a church, it seems pretty simple. You just go somewhere, you teach the Bible, a thousand people show up, and we're all happy. <laughs> now, I, now I realize if you're a pastor of a hundred people and 51 of them think you should still preach again next week you're doing really well <laughs> you, should, you should be happy uh with, with that yeah anything else okay this class has been like a dream and now it is and now it is over <laughs> okay. Uh, the we do need a spy because they may have some people in overflow out here, and so if there are people out there, we have to stall until the service is over, and so I'm going to have to do some singing and dancing here uh, uh, while that while we wait. It's all good? All right. Let me close this in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the sure promises of your word. Uh, we think of those people who came back to Israel so excited, and they saw things happening at the beginning, and then opposition came along. And it was very discouraging, and the work was very hard. And so you sent them uh, two prophets. You, you sent them reminders from your word of all your promises and that encouraged them to go back to the work that you had given them to do lord we know you've got work for all of us to do we're all a part of the building team of building your church and we all have a role to play and every role is important and we know what it's like to get discouraged at times but i pray lord that you would help us to see the big picture that we're a part of what you're building and it's going to have a glorious future. And we will, we will reap with great joy if we're willing to do the hard work now. So Lord, I pray that we might be encouraged by the truth of your word and, and that you, your, heart, your word would stir up our hearts to want to serve you all the more. For we pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen.